This is Eric McCoy, and I am hoping you are ready, ready to get high while clean. One of the most enjoyable things about this show is the people that I get to meet and the stories that I get to hear. Success in recovery means different things to different people, and the tactics people use to achieve the success can vary. And for you know those who know me, I'm not a 12-step person myself but I do have a recovery that works for me. You know, I would never discourage anybody from doing what works for you. Um, you know, I mentioned in my book that, you know, if you found the 12-step program to help you find the success that you're looking for, then do it. If church, you know, gives you what you want, then great. If sitting at a lake and speaking to frogs helps you, then get at it. <laughs> I like thinking outside the box individuals. And today we are going to be joined by Dennis Berry, who is a motivational speaker, author of Funky Wisdom, a Practical Guide to Life. And I did a little research on it. The book contains teachings from Taoism, Buddhism, and other ancient principles, along with the modern day philosophy, spiritual principles, and solutions to living in today's crazy, busy world. You know, I studied. Taoism and Buddhism. And I remember with the Buddhist beliefs that life is painful, life's in flux, and we're always changing. <laughs> and I used to know a lot more, but I remember a little with Lao Tzu, he liked to compare nature to virtues, I believe, right? Mm -hmm. He said, I think he said something about, you know, the best people are like water, which benefits all things, does not compete with them. <laughs> So I want to thank you, Dennis, for joining us today. Yeah, thank you. It's really nice to be here. Yeah, I love your philosophies. I think we have we're very like minded in a lot of ways. Yeah, probably. I want to um, now. I think I read on your bio that you've been sober since two thousand and three. Correct. Yeah. Is that correct. Yeah, I just celebrated nineteen years. Man, nineteen years. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. I remember I was thirty one when I got sober, and I was like, and clean, clean and sober. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember looking at uh, people with 20 years and I'd be like, I thought either two things. One, it was like, you're full of shit. Uh, yeah, like, yeah. I, that's not possible. Uh, but the other thing is that I was like, uh, I'm not ready for that yet. You know, yeah. I, I was like, I want to, uh, if we uh, skip over the growing, you yeah. know, we miss out on so much, you know, I mean, and then, are we, are we really ready for anything? <laughs> yeah. Right. We just like kind of go into it. Yeah. Plunge yourself into the chaos. And yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Emerge victorious. And that's kind of what happened. All of a sudden I'm like, holy crap. Now I just turned 50 and I'm like, I didn't even think, I remember when I turned 28, that was the big one, right? Because we outlived Jim Mars and Jim, Jimi Hendrix and right. Dennis Joplin. And I was like, <laughs> and then Kurt Cobain and all these people. And I was like, wow, I can't believe I made it to 28. And now I'm like 50. And uh, I'm just getting started. I originally got sober in, when I was 28. It was 2002. So January 4th, 2002, I was 28 when I got arrested the first time I arrested the, I don't know, it was like 10th time in my life, but arrested four times in six months. And I was looking at 15 years in prison. And so I did, you know, I got clean and, and then I had 11 years and I relapsed. I don't know if you had kind of ever seen my story, but uh, 2013, I decided to go test everything out again and see if it 
changed. Maybe it was different this time. You know, it was what kind of, my, <laughs> and it wasn't. It was, it was, it was worse actually. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so it's amazing um, how many people uh, play with that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Like, oh, maybe this time it will be better. Never. Yeah, it's you know I'm older, I'm smarter, I'm yeah. I had 11 years clean and sober. I mean, shit, why you know? <laughs> Got it all figured out now. Why wouldn't it be different? You know? Yeah. Um, so tell me a little bit about your book. So um, yeah, it was really interesting. I, the truth is, I never meant to write a book. Uh, I know a lot of people. It's like it's my lifelong goal. I finally wrote a book. It wasn't my lifelong goal. I just was going on long walks with my dog, and I was listening to motivational stuff and. Um, there was like some Wayne Dyer stuff, Les Brown, like all these like mm-hmm. real motivational people. And I was listening to that. And then I would start uh, on our phones, you know, when I was walking, I would be like, wow, that was awesome. And so I started like b- typing it in my, on a note in the phone. And then I would speak it and I would speak all these things that mm-hmm. came to mind to me. And all of a sudden I had like hundreds of pages of notes on my phone. Mm-hmm. And so I started organizing it and it turned into a book. And what I, did was um you know you talked about there was a lot of the buddhism stuff in there i was doing a lot of that early in sobriety and um and uh one thing that struck me because i'm not a 12-step guy anymore either i started in that program Mm -hmm. a great introduction to life this is why i drank uh you know there's something bigger than you uh Mm -hmm. let's clean up the past and then move on Right. It's a great intro. The, surra- the best thing, f- surround yourself with like minded people, uh, go to the meetings to uh, be around people so you're not isolating and figure a few things out and then go out and live. Yeah. Right. The 12 step program for me was my foundation. It really was. You know, got yeah. me, you know, got me going. I started feeling maybe you can, uh, I'm going to get your idea on this, but I started feeling that it started working against me. Mm. Um, you know, as I was really working on, you know, my self-esteem, I was really working on, um, you know, self-discipline thinking for myself. I, that was one of the, the, the discouraging things I always found in the 12 step program was they don't teach people to think for themselves. You call right. your sponsor, everything you do, you need to run by somebody crazy. Yeah. Yeah. It is really interesting. And I've had a lot of time to process all that stuff too. And I went for a, a long time. And I could re- I used to be able to recite the book, and I probably mm-hmm. can't do it as well anymore. It rarely but, have we seen a person fail who has start- thoroughly. <laughs> chapter five, how five, it works. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but what I realized for me, one of the things I realized is like, think about this. Let's think it all the way through, Eric. It's like I'm overwhelmed. I'm fearful, insecure. I have anxiety. Whatever. I need a drink. Mm-hmm. I'm overwhelmed. I'm fearful, insecure. I have anxiety. I need to get high. I'm overwhelmed. I'm fearful and scared. I need to eat. Mm-hmm. I'm overwhelmed. I'm fearful. And I, I need to go to a meeting. Mm-hmm. What's the difference? So I become dependent on meetings now yep, instead absolutely. of whatever the substance is. So, you know, when I think about the time it takes to go to a meeting, there's like the meeting, then there's the before and after the meeting, there's the traveling to and from the meeting, all because I got a little fearful somewhere yeah. along the way now what if we can learn coping skills which is what i do with my coaching whether it's like cognitive behavioral therapy or some other type of way to navigate through an emotional disturbance for a few minutes instead of three hours in the middle of the day when you could be like working on your goals and dreams in life so you know you look at balance in people's life financial needs you got you know physical health uh quiet and relaxation time um the self-growth and spirituality you know, whatever that looks like to you, uh, family and friends. And then of course we don't want to leave out fun and pleasure highness. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, but every single one of those areas you can get addicted to, and you see it all the time. You got your exercise addicts. You got the people that go to five meetings a day. You've got the people that just hang out with friends, do nothing. You know, you got the people that just do nothing. <laughs> and, and then of course the people that, um, drug abusers that were just so focused on that fun and pleasure area, which eventually starts working against us. But yeah, I mean, that's the truth. You know, it is uh, every one of those areas is. um, And so I think it really is balance. I mean, anytime I feel overwhelmed in life, my, my life's usually out of balance somewhere. Yeah. 
Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I think that we always have to be continuing to learn too. And I think that's another area where they fell short. Look, again, both of our foundations were in AA or 12 step, mm-hmm. whatever you want to call it. But here's a program that hasn't been updated in 90 years and has a success rate of less than 5%. And it's like the, the purpose is to help the newcomers who's struggling. Right. Yeah. And so I've just set my life up every day. But, you know, I realized I was going to meetings and you're sitting in these meetings with five to 10 people and everybody there has 20 years of sobriety, all talking about who understands page 58 better. And it's like, there's like a billion books. I'm like, go continue to learn and grow and uh, fail and and conquer the world. And uh, so anyway, that's what I did. But in my book, to get back there, uh, I uh, not not to divert. I, we don't have to talk about my book, but one of the things I did, the reason I brought up AA was because one of the cool things I always loved was the how, H-O-W. How do I get clean and sober? How do I start a business? How do I improve my relationships, get healthy, lose 30 pounds? And the answer is in the question, honesty, open-mindedness, and willingness. And that is really mm-hmm. a powerful um, uh, thing to use in your life because uh, mm-hmm. I, I can't solve a problem I can't admit exists. So I have to first be honest and say, hey, you know what? Things aren't going well. Uh, And then once I become honest, I become open to a new way of living. And once I'm honest and open, then I become willing to apply new ways into my life so I can have uh, changes in my life, positive changes. And so I did. I took that and I made that a, a, a little chunk of my book. And then I just put a bunch of practical applications in the book, too. I like I like what you were saying when you you take walks and then you know all this stuff comes in your head and it is so true because um, I get some of the most brilliant ideas when I don't have a pen and paper. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that amazing how yeah. it works like that? And you're like, shit. You know, of course we got phones today, so you can always record into your phone or something. <laughs> I know who carries around pen and paper, but yeah. it was cool. That's how my book came to be, and I uh, it, it wasn't a. And it's not like, you know, it hasn't made me a million dollars or anything, but when I was putting it together, uh, it took a couple of years because uh, I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> so uh, I had to like navigate through all that stuff. And, uh, and I learned a lot. And then I was like two years in and I was like, this is taking a long time. But then I looked up um, how long does it take to write a book? And it took JK Rowling who wrote Harry Potter. It took her six years to write the first book. Yeah. Six years. So I was like, oh, well, I guess I'm on track and I'll, I'll be okay. <laughs> yeah, it was crazy with my book. It took me, so originally, it, like, it took me six months, okay, to write the book. And then, because um, I was just determined. I mean, I was working on it, working on it, working on it. And, and then I sent it, I had an editor that edited the book. And the editor basically said, look, because I use I use parts of my story right throughout the book, and so like as I was talking about different, you know, finding you know who am I about being honest about you know lots of different you know practical things within recovery. The uh, the uh, editor said, you know, you should probably tell your story first because it's really you know really grabs you and stuff. So then it took me about another nine months to a year <laughs> to redo the thing, you know, and, uh, and then of course the whole publishing process and all that stuff just takes, it takes time. Yeah. It's a process, it's, yeah. but it's, it's a great accomplishment. you know, it's like, now I don't have to do that anymore. <laughs> yeah. Unless, I, unless something comes up, but for now I'm good. I mean, I have it and I'm happy with it, but yeah. I focus on my, I used to do a, a lot of speaking. And, uh, which AA got me, you know, into all that stuff, uh, early on, but then the world shut down. So I've been coaching for since 2005 okay. and, uh, but I've also done different things, but once uh, COVID hit, then the world shut down. And so there was no more speaking gigs and I have a mm-hmm. box of books, like 300 books at home that I were, cause I was doing book signings and everything. And, um, uh, so we focused uh on just coaching so okay. that's what i do now and now my life is full my my days are full i coach uh, i have lots of clients i love it it fills me up because always when i'm coaching somebody i'm reminding myself of what i need to do 
Mm, yeah. So you're, um, so you're coaching, um, I'm assuming is on zoom online or. Yes, it is. Yeah. It's remote. Yeah. And, uh, and obviously you can get people from all over the world. I do. Yeah. And what is your, um, what is the, uh, your main goal with it for people? Yeah. So, um, originally it was just addiction recovery, uh, cause that was my background. And then I started, uh, women would come to me cause I was, I was just addiction recovery for men originally, just because just like AA, it was like men were men, women, women, otherwise adult things happen and nobody gets anywhere. But, um, what happened was women would come to me and say, Hey, can you fix my brother, uncle, dad, son, or whoever, but you can't fix somebody who doesn't want to be fixed. Sure. And so I started working with the women and teaching them about self-love, self-care, self-respect, establishing healthy boundaries. And, um, and then they love that. And then I would start working with couples. So I have couples that I work with too. And I have teens that I work with. And uh, so I work in all different capacities, but my foundation, the and since this is a recovery podcast, uh, you know, about 50% of my coaching is in addiction recovery. Mm -hmm. And what we focus on is uh, remember when I'm drinking or smoking or doing whatever my problem is, it isn't really the real problem. It's what I'm using to cope with the real problem, which is my thinking. Right. And that's why I, I don't do my podcast as much anymore, but it was called the funky brain podcast. And that's where funky wisdom came from. because everybody years ago used to say, Oh, Dennis has funky brain again. So uh, my, and my ex years ago used to say, what's funky brain. I'm like, I don't know. I just get off sometimes, you know? So, uh, but that funky brain, is what the reason my whole life that I was full of fear, anxiety, insecurity, it's called the human condition. Most of us have it, but uh, instead of using things like meditation, diet, exercise, and healthy living to cope with my funky brain, I use drugs and alcohol. Mm-hmm. And 15 years went by from the time I was 15 to 31, 15, 16 years, and I never grew up. And so my goal in coaching is to help people really realize the root of the problem because uh if you don't uh, take care of the root of the problem you stay stuck in the problem yeah, right yeah. you just co- you can keep covering it up with all different kinds of uh cross addictions you know uh, that was another problem i had with aa they're like it's okay just you, you just stop drinking but you can eat a pound of cookies every day but you, that you just continue to make yourself sick the best defense against uh triggers and uh, relapse is a healthy immune system a strong body and if you keep smoking and eating chocolate and and stuff you're weakening your body Mm -hmm. which makes your mind weak too so um i I think a holistic approach and holistic a lot of people throw that word around all it means is whole sure holistic so um yeah treating treating the person the entire person you know as as a whole exactly yeah and it's like uh you know, when we start, how do you feel about yourself in the following? How do you feel about your body? How do you feel about your sex life? How do you feel about your social life and your family relationships? And how do you feel about your finances and your career? How are you in those areas? And then how do you want to be in each of those areas? Mm -hmm. And then, so my body's like this, but I want it to be like this. My family relationships like this. I want it to be like this. My sex life like this. I want it to be like this. Now we have goals. So we choose the one that's the biggest one that's going to transform your life the most. And uh, it's called the one thing because you can only work on one thing at a time. Mm-hmm. The example I like to use is uh, New Year's resolutions because everybody's familiar with those. But every New Year's, we're like, well, I'm going to write a book, start a business, lose 30 pounds, fix my relationship and blah, blah. And then two weeks later, you get overwhelmed yep. and you're like, well, screw this. So I start drinking, eating cake again. And then next year, it's the same five New Year's resolution mm-hmm. because we try to tackle too many things at yeah. once. It's good. You, there are certain things you have to take care of as an adult or as a responsible adult, but you can only do one big thing at a time at a high yep. level. Yep. hundred percent. I, I mean, when people put too many things together, they don't get any of them accomplished. Yeah. I mean, that was like, you know, when I did my book, it was like, that was my, that was my focus. And then I started working on my house, remodeling my house. That became my focus the shows that I do two podcasts. And then I got a radio show that I do also. And um, that's been a big focus. Now I will say this is that the one dilemma that I run into is my marriage. 
<laughs> well, luckily, she doesn't listen to this show, right? Yeah, right. But it's easy to get so focused on things like this. And then, of course, I sort of lose track of that sometimes. Yeah. yeah well, that's part of the human condition, too. But, you know, as long as you're aware of it, right? Mm-hmm. Awareness is the first step. I mean, you have to be aware. Yeah what's going on and then you can redirect and it's important in my my opinion i have a coach i have multiple coaches mentors uh i have spiritual people i see healers i i mean uh why limit yourself to one point of view i mean that's kind of what aa does but i mean there's so many uh different directions you can go with growth yeah Yeah, it's that um you know the 12-step program is a very black and white thinking program yeah. Uh, the common saying if you don't get a sponsor work steps to go to meetings you're going to get loaded yeah i hate when people say that uh, or i'm powerless i'm not powerless i'm powerful that's like, the whole thing about the program is that it's i mean even if you look at it, the 12-step program but yeah in reality is that it is about taking power back over our life how do i do that well number one is i got to get rid of the substance that's taking my power away you know yeah. i've thought about this with recovery a lot you know, and everybody always says like, what are we really recovering from? You know, it's a lifetime thing. Right. And, and you kind of think like, well, shit, what is it? The lifetime thing. Right. And, and I like your idea. And I do think there's something to it, the funky brain <laughs> that always is with us that I don't know if ever completely goes away. <laughs> well, it's just managing it. It is. And, and, but I've, I've really thought so hard on this recovery thing. And I still do believe firmly that we are always going to be recovering from a loss. I mean, I I look at, for me, meth was my drug of choice and it was my first true love in life. Mm -hmm. What what about, what do we always say about our true first true love, our first love? We don't want to lose that. And I mean, it was, I held on to it for a lot of years and then, then I had to give it up and I had to let it go, you know, and I let it go because of all the other losses in my life, <laughs> lost my family, lost finances, lost relationship, lost my freedom, you know, lost myself. And, and so for me to get all of those back, I had to lose the other thing that are, that was at one point in time, the most important thing to me. And, uh, and so I, I do firmly believe that it is always a grieving. There is certain grieving process that we go through because do I miss it sometimes? Yeah. Do I think about it sometimes? Sure. <laughs> I have things that are so much more important to me now. Yeah. And you don't have to act upon those urges. Yeah. They just come and go. And, you know, what you said, we, I call it the funky brain. It's really, it's just called the human condition. Yeah. Buddha yeah. talked about it 2,500 years ago. He called it the monkey brain. Mm-hmm. That's it. Yeah. You know, yeah. you sit in meditation. Most people can't do it. They're scared to death of their, their thoughts and silence. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, there's a all the philosopher i can't remember who it was but all of our problems stem from our inability to sit quietly in a room alone yeah we always have to be doing something we have to go make money and fix this and do that and make this and be this and we can't just sit still and that not sitting still is the source of all of our problems that's where the buddhists mastered that yeah. You know, I mean, the, I mean, they go a little extreme. <laughs> I mean, some of them sit for enormous amounts of time <laughs> for months. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I mean, that would drive, I, I, I couldn't do that. <laughs> yeah. But you do- know, I've, I've done uh, retreats and stuff for a few days of uh, just complete silence. And you know what happens is, and I think that you can do that. Uh, I, I know you, you can just by talking to you is that, uh, you know, the first day it's like, Mm -hmm. like your, your insides are screaming at you because we've never done that before. And it's because we're so desensitized Mm -hmm. uh, to what's actually going around on around us. We live in a noisy world with lawnmowers and horns and sirens and uh, alarms all day long. We don't realize that we're living like this. All of our muscles, muscles are tense, our back, our shoulders, and as soon as we get to nature, as soon as we get to silence and stillness, when we go to the mountains, the beach, or wherever your nature place is, mm-hmm. we calm down immediately mm-hmm. because that's our natural state. Mm-hmm. That's where we're supposed to be. Everybody, if you go on vacation, at the end of every vacation, they always say the same thing. Oh, it's back to the real world tomorrow. 
But that, this isn't the real world. This is a world that's all fucked up, that has us stressed out and ain't full of anxiety, has yeah. to take pills yeah. to be okay, yeah. where yeah. we spend a whole year to save money to go back to the real world and relax for a week. Yeah. That's like, why vacations are so important. Totally. Uh, to, to, and they need to be more than once a year. Yeah. Yep. That's why, yeah. What is it? Europe has, what do they do? Like Two months. Yeah, two months. France, yeah, it's a it uh, socialist. Okay. Yeah. It's a socialist government, yeah, and everybody gets two months off now, and they all have insurance. But they're also uh, there's pros and cons to all that. Sure, but sure. one of the pros is they do get two months off, paid. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, and so they all go on these long vacations, yeah, and yeah. Uh, it's a it's an interesting concept. But I I think uh, yeah, there's think definitely work, some there's definitely negatives to it. But that idea is, I think, amazing. You know, it is just- amazing. Yeah, we need to do that. And, you know, here's the other thing. It's like, yes, we need to do that. Some people are meant to uh, or have higher tolerance levels of urban living or living in uh, the crazy world that we live in. Um, and that's fine. But there, you don't have to go away for two months or even a week. Mm-hmm. Go take your shoes off and go to the park. You know, mm-hmm. go do something in nature where you can calm down and disconnect and get back to uh, our center. Mm-hmm. Because uh, really, and when you ask, what do I do with my coaching? It's to get centered and focused mm-hmm. on what's really important in life. We're yeah. so uncentered. We're focused on money and who we're supposed to be and do. And uh, we're conditioned from birth yeah. to be this and that and make this and be, marry this person and do all these things. Well, we're conditioned through roles. I mean, you know, it's like, you know, you ask a lot of people like, so who are you? Well, I'm a counselor. I'm a teacher. I'm a this, I'm a that. That's not who you are, you know? And I, and I am a counselor. I mean, and I am a teacher, (laughs) but you know, I, when I work with clients, this is always one of the greatest questions we ask is who are you? You know, who are you as a person? Because as we know, in, in our addiction, we lose ourselves. My, you know, the first line to my book is I killed that motherfucker. Right. And, and it was really the premise of, I killed who I was, you know, I was, I lost myself, my values, my morals, you know, everything that really meant something to me wasn't with me anymore. It was, but it wasn't. And so I had to reconnect with those, those things. And that is one of the deepest questions of course, <laughs> who am I, you know? And, uh, but yeah, it's so much more about, you know, like I look at it today and, you know, I'm a man of integrity. I'm somebody that genuinely cares about people. I'll put my hand out for people. I'm somebody that fights for what I believe is right. Um, you know, to me, like with substance abuse, you know, my biggest fight to, two of them is, is to fight the stigma of substance abuse because it kills me. You know, you see people with, with, you know, the a good majority of society, they're just a waste of space or, you know, angry at them, you know, hate these alcoholic drug abusers, not really understanding the dependency factor. We'll never solve problems through hate. You know, we'll never solve problems through anger. And, uh, and then the other one I, I really have been focused on recently is, is giving a voice to those we've lost, you know, with the, the enormous overdose deaths that, um, to, to take it away from the fact that they're just a number or they're just a statistic. No, these were people. And these are people with families. Let's try to give, bring, bring the humanity back to it. Mm, that makes yeah. sense. <laughs> yeah. Powerful stuff. That was, that was really great. That whole, that whole segment there. And I, I think what you were talking about, uh, early on is that, that conditioning. And it, you were like, I, I had to, uh, to find that guy again Mm -hmm. or or whatever, however you termed it. But uh, yeah, the truth is, it's like when dad's sperm hits mom's egg, we're perfect right then. Yeah. And then we spend nine months or however long you're in there floating around. Everything's perfect. I'm getting fed. It's warm. And then I get, I pop out and the doctor smacks me on the ass and I started screaming and I'm in this big, scary place going, Oh my God. And we go into survival mode and right then we start being conditioned. And so it's not about when you get sober or anything uh, about learning new things. It's about unlearning. Yeah. 
That's Absolutely. what you were talking about. Getting in touch with who you really are. Yeah. Yeah. Cause we are, I think about this all the time. I mean, how many things were we taught that are dishonest? How many things were we taught that, that are wrong? And so many people keep that. I mean, we have belief systems that, that um, tear us down. You know, we got belief system, you know, if you're, if you grow up in a family, you know, you're a piece of shit, you'll never amount to nothing. And then these people hold on to that belief system. That's the reality they're going to create for themselves, 100%. but it's not true. I mean, that's the whole thing is that, that, why does that have to be true? Mm. It doesn't. So a lot of the work that I do, and since we're getting deeper in our conversation here now is, uh, you know, we are riddled with limiting beliefs right we're only limited by our own limiting beliefs which were it's which is all learned behavior right everything is so is our addictions everything learned behavior Mm -hmm. Uh, a lot of the work i do is uncovering our emotional childhood wounds Mm -hmm. right so which is really where all this stuff comes from and you know when we go into rejection uh abandonment betrayal humiliation uh, injustice. Those are the five main uh, childhood wounds that we have. And a lot of people right away, they go, oh yeah, uh, this girl broke my heart in high school or this guy did this, cheated on me or whatever it is. But that's not what we're talking about. These wounds happen when we're babies, you know, from zero to three years old. And we don't even have to remember. It's not important where the wound came from. All that matters is that we have it and we use masks in the form of behaviors to cover up our wounds. So it may be when you were six months old, you were crying and you wanted your mom to pick you up, but she was busy and she couldn't pick you up right then. So right away you felt abandoned and betrayed and you went into survival mode. And what happens is as we grow older, we still use those masks into our teens, 20s, 30s, and beyond, 40s. Mm -hmm. And we realize at some point when and when we're doing this work, which is the most powerful work I've ever done, right? Or been part of, and I've done it and I teach it. Um, we start removing the masks and we realize it's not me doing these behaviors, these codependent behaviors, the addiction. It's not me uh, being sensitive to criticism. It's not me seeking approval. It's not me doing these behaviors. It's the little boy. Mm. It's the little child, the little boy, the little girl who is scared. In that moment, that's who's acting out right now in those ways. And when you realize that you're not that little kid anymore, and you could just be you, the 30, 40, 50 year old person that you are, and you're safe. Mm -hmm. And when you start doing that writing and that work, and you realize you become more confident and realize that nothing can hurt you, and there's no need to get drunk or high or eat a pound of cake uh, or overspend or watch six hours of netflix or porn or whatever your yeah. uh, cross addiction is whatever you're using to numb out your feelings yeah, yeah the, you know i think everybody you know we're conditioned to be a certain person a lot of times that's not who we actually are that's so we right. spend our lives putting mass i like your mass idea it's kind of the carl young concept too you know with the, but you know we spend our lives um with these masks of being the person that we think we're supposed to be, you know, that other people. So, so we're so worried what other people are thinking about us. Constantly. And I think that's the biggest, you know, if we can get to that place where we stop caring what people think about us, you know, of who we are as a person. And uh, it's scary. That is a scary place to go. You know, that's something I, that's something I really had to do for myself was, um, you know, really find who I am and I'm the best version of what I could find. And my, I'm still evolving. I think we're all still evolving. <laughs> you know, we all learn new things and different things and we find new, um, you know, uh, twists to maybe certain beliefs that we had that now are a little bit truer to us, <laughs> if that makes sense. <laughs> oh, yeah. And, um, and so that's, that's uh, the thing I, I, you know, I really do believe that today I'm the best version of me that I've found yet. Mm. Yeah. That's powerful, man. I, I'm happy to hear that. I'm happy to hear you say that. Most people can't say that. Yeah, no, I absolutely. Um, and a lot of I, people I, don't even understand what that means. Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. And so we have to uncover that again. It's not necessarily learning uh, anything new. It's unlearning. Mm-hmm. It's unlearning that conditioning that's decades old. And we don't realize that we think we're doing fine. We go to work, we make money or we don't, or whatever we're, it is we're doing. And uh, cause we're still breathing. Yeah. I'm alive, yeah. you know? So something I'm doing is right. But are you happy? Are yeah. you content? Can you look yourself in the mirror? Uh, wh- and are you working on your dreams? Are you working on your dreams or are you working on somebody else's dream? That's big. Yeah. Are you just, are you just settling? Yeah. Are you settling? Yeah. And settling is the, the cause of most fear, anxiety, depression, uh, mm-hmm. because we're not living up to who uh, we think somebody else wants us to be. Like you said that earlier, it's like, you know, a lot of kids uh, and you know this and most people know this, but it's like, you know, when you see doctors and lawyers and high performance people, like a lot of them are miserable because mm-hmm. they were, they were, driven into those types of roles to get 4.0 grade point averages and be the best on the on the the football team or whatever it is and to keep excelling and exceeding so your parents could be proud or that that you'll look like this or make this much money and uh all the money in the world and there's still this dead person inside i have a fascinating story in fact so uh, a, a friend uh, who I call a friend now. Uh, I used to be a chef. That's the reason for some of my alcoholism and addiction. But uh, what I did I, over the last 15 years was I had a private uh, chef catering company. So I would just do really high end private meals because I'm a, I'm a real chef. So um, anyway, I would cook for these affluent people. And one of them, I went over to his house one day and it was this massive blowout house. Like, you know, we see those every now and then, but and I've seen a lot of them and I used to work on private yachts and I did, I led quite a colorful life, but this house was extraordinary. So I was dealing with mostly the wife and the husband walked by and I was like, so what do you do <laughs> anyway? And uh, he goes, well, my great grandfather invented the automobile clutch. Well, and so he doesn't do anything. It was just passed down to him. He plays golf. Yeah. But what was fascinating is this this story is that he says, you know, Dennis, cause I ended up like, we would go out and have double dates with him and uh, we ended up being friends. And he goes, this is interesting. He, he plays golf with these people that are worth nine figures like him, right. Uh, hundreds of millions of dollars. And, but those people, those other people, they talk about their successes. They talk about, they're all at top of their game, CEOs, owners of, mm-hmm. you know, conglomerates and, uh, he said he felt uh, insecure because he could never contribute to those conversations. So he would drink and to cover up the pain of not being able to uh, feel a- fit accomplished. Yeah. Right. So it, I found that really interesting. It's like all the money in the world. If you're feeling um, empty on the inside, I give you a million dollars, which I can't right now, but I can give you a million dollars, but you're still going to feel empty on the inside. And when you take that million dollars away, there's still the empty person. Yeah. yeah, that's the the one of the greatest fallacies of happiness. If I just had money, mm-hmm. you know, if I just had more money, I'd be happy. Mm-hmm. But money creates fear, which is the greatest destroyer of happiness. You know, people are like, oh, money's bringing me happiness. So I go out, let's say hypothetically, I go out and I make millions. And then a lot of times what happens to people is they reach a point to where their very survival is based on money. Yeah. And, uh, and then, yeah, you take that away and they're, they're done. Yeah. It's all ego based uh, yeah. existence. So you take the money away and you're left with this unhappy person yeah. and, uh, you know, money doesn't, and people hear this all the time. Money doesn't buy happiness, but, and I've had, uh, I've made a million and I've lost a million. I've been high, low, everything in between. Um, what I found is that money doesn't buy you happiness. It, that is true. It gives you freedom. Security. It gives you security. It gives you freedom and security. Absolutely. And that leads to happiness. So, you know, people are misconstrued about what does that mean? Like money's the root of all evil, but that's not what the Bible says. That's where that comes from. And I'm not a religious person, but what the Bible says is the love of money is the root of all evil. So when you start 
putting money before your health or your relationships or uh, other important things in your life, then uh, that's where it becomes a problem. Yeah. And that's what the U.S. is all about. Uh, (laughs) But I'll tell you what, the one thing, though, that is big is appreciation. You know, if you can appreciate if you, if, you know, you can have a lot of money and be happy, but I, I generally do feel that for people that have a lot of money, but they appreciate what they have, they don't mm-hmm. take it for granted. They appreciate what they have, you know, appreciation, like the strongest outbound form of love, the idea of giving of everything and asking for nothing. Inner peace. That's really the goal mm-hmm. it's, it's really to have inner peace. And, uh, you know, I, I think, unfortunately, because we have to unlearn all this stuff, it takes time. We have to learn how to be peaceful. Mm-hmm. And instead, peaceful is our natural state. Happiness and peace of peacefulness is our natural state. And we've gotten so far away from it that it's like, how do I do that? Well, I have to sit and I have to uncover all this shit in order to get down to this place of peace. And we have it all ass backwards. Mm-hmm. But living a life of service, you know, and at first, I didn't understand that. And gratitude and service, I mean, those... I mean, if you can live life with gratitude and service, you, you'll be happy. And all those things that you're chasing after, all the money, the material wealth, and all that stuff, uh, when you're living a life of gratitude and service and you're peaceful, that stuff, that money and stuff, it just follows you around. It kind of just like, you know, lands on you. Mm-hmm. But we don't understand that. And at first, we're like, you have to live a life of service, service work. And I was like, I don't have time for service. I have to like go out and make money, you know, but everybody's so focused on being retired. And the goal is not to retire. The goal is to not have to work, but I don't want to ever retire. We need to live a life of purpose. Mm -hmm. You know, you hear like Charles Schultz, he wrote uh, Snoopy and he retired. He died a week after he stopped writing peanuts. Mm -hmm. I mean, isn't that crazy? The Mm -hmm. Muppets, I think the same thing happened with Jim Henson. Like there was, once we lose our purpose. Yeah. We need to have a reason to wake up in the morning. And when we don't, we drift into depression, addiction, anxiety, fear, broken relationships. That's where that stuff comes from. If you really want to heal on the inside, live a life of purpose. And and that purpose, it can't be handed to you. We have to create it. Some people are born into their purpose, a fulfilling purpose. But most of us, we have to create that purpose. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No. yeah, it's a, and passion. I always, I always see that. If you find that thing that if you can find the job that doesn't feel like a job, that's the ideal job. Yeah. <laughs> because it's something that you enjoy. Passionate. I love counseling. I yeah. love doing what I do. Um, I love teaching. I mean, that's what I love more than anything. Teaching. And and I get high doing it. And it's funny you saying, you know, I stand with clients, they they all know my philosophy. And, uh, and I'll tell them, I'll go, man, I'm getting high right now. And, uh, and then of course they all snicker and stuff, you know, but, um, that's the most powerful feeling in, in the world. It is, it is because it's genuine, hmm. you know, it's genuine. I, you know, I think of meth and stuff, it's an illusion. It really is. It's just this illusion that you're creating. Cause it's not real. I mean, there's nothing real about that. You know, what is truth, right? So what is truth? You know, truth doesn't change, right? truth doesn't change. And so if I'm getting high on drugs, that changes. And eventually, eventually it gets to a point where it stops working. You know, we're killing our neurons, we're killing our neurotransmitters, we're destroying our ability to get high in the long run. But if I figure out ways to do it naturally, that's truth, right? Because it doesn't change. It can always, I can always find that. It's like seeing, uh, uh, somebody's struggling and starts to see the lights go off. Just mm-hmm. like there's no better feeling in the world than to help somebody. Yeah. And yeah. that's what all that means. And sometimes helping somebody comes in the form of giving money. Sometimes it's counseling or coaching like we do. Sometimes it's smiling. Mm-hmm. You know, you never know what somebody's going through when you go into the store and you see people with these yeah. frowns or their head down, or you could tell that they're clearly unhappy or disturbed. Just smile. Yeah. I mean, even, you know, the homeless people, you know, we all have these assumptions, you know, we hate the homeless. So they're just, you know, they bring rats, <laughs> you know, all this, but we don't know their stories. That's right. And everybody has a story. Everybody's got a story. And some of them are probably horrific. 
Yeah. And, and there's solutions for, for helping them too. And it's like, we can't help everybody, but we can uh, make an effort mm -hmm. uh, to help one person. Mm -hmm. And then that one person is going to help one person. And it, it's, you know, it causes a ripple effect. Yeah. I, so, you know, just help what you can inside your bubble. For me, you know, what's really important. Uh, I live in Playa del Carmen near the ocean. Uh, you live in LA. Maybe the beach is important to you too. The ocean. Uh, I don't get into politics or any of that stuff, but if you really check out the ocean, it's really like there's some problems going on there. Mm. So, uh, um, so I do some things to help support that. And I do some things to help with sobriety. And then I live my life and I'm full and happy. I didn't uh, get drunk. I didn't spend all my money buying shots for people at a bar. I don't know to be like a big shot. I didn't, I'm not waking up with girls. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I, I live a life of integrity. I pay my taxes. Yeah. And uh, so there's the idea. Uh, it's not a not drinking or getting high contest. It's about being an adult. It's about being a grown up, looking the world in the eye and uh, going out and chasing after your goals and dreams. We only, our time here is finite, yeah. you know, yeah. it's like, what are you going to do? Yeah. That's where we got to kick time. ourselves in the ass. It's like self-love. I mean, that's, you know, it's like learning, learning to love ourselves. If I love myself, I'm going to treat myself with respect. Mm -hmm. If I love myself, then, you know, I will focus on things that are, are going to be in my best interest. Mm -hmm. And you'll attract love into your life too. Yeah, definitely. Is there something I ha we haven't talked about that you do want to talk about? I do a lot of the, my videos, my life mastery school. Uh, it's a series of free videos that anybody can come check out all the time on my website. And, uh, but other than that, I don't have anything specific. I mean, okay. if you're listening and you're struggling, everybody, you know, people ask me all the time, if you could, uh, give me one word of advice. What that was going to be my next question was if, if you were to say something to those out there struggling, what would you say? <laughs> I always say the same thing. And I get this, asked this question all the time. I always post it on my social media stuff. Everything that I do is always continue to ask for help. Yeah. Asking for help is a sign of strength, not a sign of weakness. If you don't know how to do something, ask, mm -hmm. you know, you'll get there faster. Yeah. And, uh, don't ever lose your sense of wonder. That's one of my favorite little slogans. It's like, stay curious. You know, the real pain stops when we stop growing and stop learning new things and life slows down. And then we feel like, what is all this for anyway? Well, continue to learn, continue to live in gratitude and service, and it'll make more sense. Hey, I want to thank you so much for coming on here. I really appreciate it. Everybody check out his book. Um, and then how do people get a hold of you? The best way is on my website, dennisberry.com. And there you can buy the book. You can uh, see Life Mastery School, all the different videos. There's addiction recovery, health and wellness, meditation and mindfulness, love and relationships. Just like there's like 15, 20 videos in each series of just little tips and tricks to get you through. Awesome. And uh, yeah. And my podcast, there's old episodes on the Funky Brain podcast on there too. You're going to get that up and going again or? I thought about it. I did a an episode about a month ago and there's about 150 episodes, I think. And uh, what happened was I was losing some of my energy because I did so many for a while and uh, you need to have that energy. You yeah. know? And so maybe it's been like eight or nine months off. And so, yeah, maybe I could start it up again sometime. Yeah. Let me come on your show. I would love that if we do that. Absolutely. Hey, uh, again, I want to thank everybody for tuning in to another episode of High Wall Clean. And as I always like to say, keep getting high, but let's do it clean. Mm -hmm.